has been IBM. Um, although Joel was clearly invented by Sun, is now owned by Oracle, um, a lot of the contributions to the Java community process and a lot of the development work um, has been done by IBM. I'm sure Chris will move to that. Yeah, there'll be some content um, on that. Um, but uh, what is he going to do tonight? Uh, and I should say that Chris is a very good person for this because uh, of his position as the, the man for Java service problems in, uh, in IBM worldwide with responsibility over a number of different labs. Um, the person who actually troubleshoots and directs the solution to the most difficult problems um, as um, uh, his other counterparts for other pieces of IBM software do. Uh, so I'm sure he's very much been at the sharp edge um, in some of the issues. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think somebody who Chris is getting, speaks with great authority on the subject, um, and he's going to tell us about Java, past, present, future. But we're very interested to know where Java is going to and what we can expect to see in the future Java 8 release. So without further ado, over to you, Chris. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so Jeff, Jeff says uh, what I'm going to cover over the next hour is a little bit about where Java came from. Um, and I'll explain how IBM is related to Java. Um, but I'm mostly just going to focus on what's in Java 7, which is the latest version that you can get today. What's in Java 8 is due to be released in October this year. And then some of the other stuff that's happening, which may be in Java 9, some of it might actually happen in the of Java 8. We don't know yet because it's, it's future work that's going on. Um, but as Jeff says, I work for IBM, which means we have to have one of these. Um, and noticeably, since uh, Oracle bought Sun, whenever uh, the main Java engineering team from Sun, now Oracle, do presentations, they have to have one of these as well. Um, so it's just a bunch of unreadable block capitals that says that <laughs> anything I say from this point forward could be a lie. <laughs> um, but, but me, so I've been working um, as part of the IBM Java Technology Center for, for 13 years. So um, I've been working on developing JVMs and JDKs. So I've done Java virtual machine development, I've done just in time compiler development, I've worked on different bits of the class libraries doing AWT and Swing and that sort of stuff. Um, but as Jeff said, I spent a lot of my time um, working with people doing enterprise deployments of Java to make sure that they work and that they don't hit bugs and to troubleshoot when that happens. Um, recently I've been doing Java in the cloud, so how Java integrates well into remote server um, environments and virtualized hardware and software, um, doing monitoring and diagnostics and working customers on highly resilient systems. But um, yeah, most people, like, if you ask anybody to think about Java, they think Sun, Oracle, Right. IBM is just someone that uses Java, right? Well, um, we actually got involved in Java before Java first existed. Um, so we have something called the IBM Java Technology Center. Um, it's based in multiple locations, so it's a globally distributed team, but we have a, a group called the IBM Java Technology Center. And what we do is we take reference Java technologies now, one of these is OpenJDK and Java as produced by Sun and now Oracle. Uh, other locations for this are things like Apache. So um, Apache has the Zalan Xerces project that does XML and XSLT transforms. Um, there was the Harmony project that did some class libraries. So there's lots of open source groups out there which are doing things with Java. So we look at a lot of those. Um, we're actually the major contributors to a lot of them. So Zalan Xerces was a project that largely came out of IBM. Um, Eclipse is a project that was founded by IBM and so on. So it's not that IBM takes open source stuff. It's uh, a community collaboration between the two. So we take these technologies and bring them into the IBM Technology Center. In the case of OpenJDK, um, IBM and Oracle are considered to be the two major partners in OpenJDK. So we do a lot of the OpenJDK development as well. So we take that technology in. We then 
uh, do what I get considers to be quality engineering. So we look at improving reliability, uh, serviceability, that's monitoring and diagnostics, doing huge amounts of testing, and making sure that Java works on IBM's platforms, which are AIX, uh, Linux on mainframes, Linux on power series boxes, and we also do a version of Windows and Linux and, and Linux Intel as well. Um, we take in a bunch of requirements from groups around IBM, IBM business partners, IBM software vendors, and um, our end clients and customers to work out what things need to be put into Java. Those all get handed back to OpenJDK or to the open source groups when we do that. And what drops out the other end is what we call IBM Java. So we do have our own versions of Java. And what's inside IBM Java, um, kind of the key bits, the bottom right hand corner. So when you get a, a JDK, a Java runtime from IBM, um, what you get is a Java virtual machine that's created by IBM. We have our own Java virtual machine. Um, Oracle has their own called Hotspot, so basically we have our equivalent. Then there's the core class libraries. So these are things like Java Util, Swing, AWT, all of that sort of stuff. Now that box is mostly red with a tinge of blue. So when you get it from IBM, it's mostly exactly the same code you would have on the release from Oracle. Uh, but there's little bits in there that we've done in order to make it work with the IBM Java virtual machine, which runs on the IBM platforms. Uh, we then add in three packages, which are IBM technology. We do our own version of XML, uh, crypto. So we do um, security packages that have US federal government compliance, um, and that integrate with different hardware and has acceleration support and so on because our clients ask for it. Um, and we have our own version of the core brawl. Um, that's kind of a strange one. So if you use something called RMI IOP in Java, um, IBM actually created that. Uh, it's something that we came up with and we made available to Sun at the time. Uh, Sun looked at it and said, oh, we'll, we'll do our own. So we were kind of there first. Oracle or Sun came second. They chose to keep their own version. Um, but for AWT Swing, Java 2D, all the other stuff, we use exactly the same code as Oracle does. So if you take your Java application and you want to run it on the IBM JVM or you want to run it on the Oracle JVM, it should just run because we use the same class libraries. The APIs, the interface that you use is identical. Um, we aim for what's called bug-for-bug -bug compatibility. So the behavior <laughs> is identical. You go to the API spec, and it's a bit gray, it's a bit vague about how it should work. Well, we try to make sure it does exactly what it does on the others. So why it wants debug anywhere, uh, applies. Um, so that's what we produce. And um, as Jeff said, we kind of got a worldwide development team. So we've got um, a team in Hursley, near Winchester, which is where I work. We do integration delivery, customer support. We do monitoring and diagnostics. Uh, we've also got a team in Ottawa in Canada. So Ottawa do the Java virtual machine for Java EVI, so for micro edition, for SE, so des desktops and standard edition, and EE, the enterprise edition. Uh, they use the same JVM in all cases. Uh, we've got a team in Toronto that does our JIT com compiler, which takes your Java code and converts it into machine code. Now, the reason why that's done in Toronto is on the same site we have the team that does our compilers for C, C++, COBOL, Fortran, etc. So it's a lab of people who know how to do compilers. So we use the same team for Java compilers as for C, C++, COBOL, etc. Uh, we've got a team in India and Bangalore. Uh, they do testing, customer support for the right hand side of the map, so Asia, um, they're in the time zone for. They do field development as well. Uh, we've got a team in Shanghai. They do globalization, they do specialized testing, and they're now doing work on Java in the cloud. And you'll see later on what we're doing in the cloud. Um, and then we've got three teams in the US Austin, Rochester, and Poughkeepsie. They do integration with hardware platforms. So Poughkeepsie is the team that creates the mainframe. So we have a team there that does integration of our Java with the mainframe to make sure it works properly. Uh, likewise, Austin creates our P-series boxes, so we have a team that does P-series integration, and Rochester does I-series. 
Um, and then we've got a team in Phoenix that does uh, the class libraries for micro edition. So we've got, you know, what's that, nine, uh, nine different groups around the world, usually located where we've got a center of excellence for something. So Austin, the center of excellence is Power, so we, um, P-Series, so we have a team there that does the integration with Power and P-Series. In Toronto, it's compilation, so that's where I compile it go on base. So whilst I work for IBM and Oracle is uh, the owners of Java, we do a lot with Java, and we have been for um, something like 16 years, I think it is. So that kind of brings us to the timeline for Java. So the story of Java kind of started in 1991. So what happened in 1991 was um, some were interested in uh, investing um, in finding whether there was anything they could do in consumer electronics. So they created um, a team called Project Green. And the aim of Project Green was to work out whether they could sell something that works with consumer electronics. And the problem with consumer electronics is there's a vast array of different devices, different hardware, and that you've got to deal with. So this is where the concept in Java of write once, write anywhere came from. One programming language works in the same way on all platforms, but it covers a huge number of devices. So, so that's what they were looking at. And under Project Green, uh, James Gosling uh, started on a work on a programming language called Oak. So that's where they were in 91. Uh, in 1992, uh, they did a demo of a PDA called Star 7 uh, that included the Oak programming language. Um, and it pretty much bombed. No one was interested in their PDA. Uh, in 1993, they span off Project Green um, into a subsidiary of Sun called First Person. And what First Person were looking at was creating uh, interactive TV boxes, so set-top boxes to plug into your TV. Um, they were talking to a AT&T and these kind of telecoms companies. Um, as a guide of where the industry was at this point, this was the point at which Tim Berners-Lee started talking about W3 at CERN. So this is when w, the World Wide Web became available at CERN for the first time. Meanwhile, um, Sun is looking at doing interactive devices for set-top boxes. Um, so in 1994, they took the stuff that they were doing for set-top boxes, which still no one was particularly interested in, um, and they used the Oak programming language out of it to call something, create something called WebRunner. Now, WebRunner was effectively a browser with Oak support. And this is back in the day where browsers only did static content. And what they did was they had a demo of a molecule that could be moved in the browser as the mouse moved. And this was considered to be radical at the time. Um, and that was the time that Netscape was first released. So back in 94, Netscape first releases Navigator, and or, uh, Sun has this thing called uh, Web Runner, which allows you to move something inside a browser. Okay, um, in 1995, Oak became Java. Now, the reason why Oak became Java was a trademark dispute. Um, so there was something called Oak Technologies, and they were worried about using the name Oak, um, which apparently was named because James Gosling had an Oak tree outside his office window. Uh, but they moved it over to be called Java. Um, they made a beta of Java available on a very small website, and they got a huge amount of traction within um, the first couple of months. Um, and they did a, a demo of their web runner uh, browser at TED. Um, so at this point, uh, Netscape announced that they would adopt Java. So what happened in 1996 was Java 1.05 was released. So at this point, what was to become Java had already been five years in the making through the programming language called Oak. Um, in the first version, there wasn't too much there. There was a programming language. Um, there was a version of AWT, but they changed the event model pretty quickly in 1.1, um, and they had the web runner back browser. Um, as happens early in the lifetime of a programming language, you quickly have to do stuff to make it easy for programmers to actually do something real. So 1.1 came out in 97, where they started allowing you to have inner classes for the first time. There was Java being support, there was JDBC, uh, remote method invocation, and reflection, so you could do introspection at that point in time. Um, in 1997, um, they were already 
saying that they were the number two programming language by for professional developers, and they had 400,000 people using Java at the point that Java 1.1 existed. Uh, Java 1.2 came out in 98, and they rebranded Java to call it Java 2. So from there on in, it was always J2 SE. Um, so that came out, um, there was an update, it was the UI from AWT to Swing. Uh, the first browser plugin, so you can start plugging it into multiple browsers. Um, the Java collections were introduced for the first time, so you have, you know, hash table um, was introduced as, a, as an API in a class that you can use. And then in 99, um, this is the first time that they started talking about rather than just having Java, we'll have Java Micro Edition for handheld devices, Java Standard Edition for the desktop, and Java Enterprise Edition for the server. Okay, so that was the first 10 years. But then from 2000 onwards, in 2000, they released what's now J2SE 1.3. Um, they have remote inv uh, method invocation over the wire with Corba, uh, Java naming directory, um, Java platform debugger, proxy classes. So they're starting to bring in more function and more support packages so that it's got a, a rich ability to build applications that do real stuff at this point. Um, they announced Java web Start, and most importantly, this is where I joined IBM and started making a difference to Java, or, or, or not, as the case may be. Um, so Java was officially, uh, what, four years old when I joined, but it had actually been worked on for about nine years. Uh, when I started, I was working on the 118 JDK and the 112 JDK and the release for, for 1.3. Uh, in 2001, IBM created the Eclipse project to give you an IDE in order to do development. Uh, one of the reasons behind that was you could look at um, the ability to actually write Java code. And if you compare it to things like C and C++, there was a lot of support from Borland. And uh, there was MS Dev. So there was rich IDEs for doing development for other languages, but not so much for Java. So IBM created the Eclipse project, um, and when that first came out, I used to do all of my development for the JVM and for the Java class I was using the VI like everybody else. So it was kind of a, a big change, and I admit I was sat there going, I'm not sure about this UI stuff, it doesn't, mm, don't trust it. Um, but now everyone, I think, uses uh, UIs, so it's, it's very much carried Java forward at that point. Uh, 1.4 came out in 2002, giving you um, assertions for the first time. So now that they've got to 1.4, they're starting to look at actually how the language needs to evolve rather than just supplying more support packages. So you've got assertions and you've got regular expressions, um, both of which were in other languages for some time. Um, they brought in the logging API, uh, new IO, so which is NIO, which is the ability to do, at that point, non-blocking IO. Um, XML XSLT was brought in, as was WebStar. Uh, and at this point, they're claiming that they've got Java on 550 million desktops. Uh, part of that was when you got Java um, and you got, uh, so when you got a Windows desktop, Java was already on it. So as Windows was prevalent, it was going um, out to every user. Um, Java 5 came out in 2004. And at this point, they're starting to really concentrate on the language again. So you get auto-boxing, enumeration, generics, metadata, so annotations. So they're all language changes rather than putting in additional support packages. Then in 2004, we've got um, Java downloads hitting 7 million, 4 million developers. Um, because of ME, it's on 1.5 billion devices, and there's 550 user groups worldwide. So Java's become pretty massive as of the middle of the early 2000s. Um, the numbers just keep increasing each year. Um, then Java 6 comes out in 2006. Now at this point, you'll notice there's basically a release of Java every two years. So 1.3 in 2000, 1.4 in 2002, 1.5 in 2004, 1.6 in 2006. And what's in there is performance, some changes to the UI, Java consoles and changes to the collection framework, not a lot's happening. So it's, it's like they're starting to run out of ideas. 
And then in 2006, um, they released Java under the GPL that became open source. So that was the first point that Java became the open source platform that it is today. Um, that led to a, a, another increase in developers and its usage. Um, but at the same point in time, this was where Sun as a company was starting to struggle. So the fact that we had our last release in, what was it, 2008, means that we should be expecting a new release to happen around 2009, 2010. Uh, but that didn't happen because uh, Sun started to try and sell itself. Um, and it was announced late in 2009 that Oracle was looking to buy Sun. Um, and in 2010, it did buy Sun. So at this point, development and release of Java stopped because of the turmoil around ownership of Java and ownership of, of the company. So then what happened in 2011 was um, Oracle announced a roadmap for Java that said, Look, most of what we wanted to put in Java 7 isn't ready. So we can either wait until 2012, 2013 for the next release of Java, which is going to be like seven years since Java 6, or we can get something out in Java 7 um, in 2011 and then defer the rest to Java 8 in 2013. So that's the approach that they took. So what went into Java 7 was um, what they called small language changes. Um, so a, a bunch of ease of use programming changes. Um, new IoT, so they had new IO, they just extended it. Um, Invoke Dynamic, which is actually quite important, it's probably the most important thing that happened in Java 7. Um, and some more concurrency work. So what they deferred to Java 8 um, was Lambda expressions. So that was supposed to be the big thing in Java 7, and it didn't happen. And the other thing that they deferred to Java 8 was modularity. So anyone that's ever used Eclipse plugins in OSGI, the idea of having your application as a bunch of modules, which can do dynamic lookup at runtime to get the latest version of it, that is what they were supposed to put into Java 7. They deferred it to Java 8. And if you'll notice the list of Java 8, there's no sign of modularity there. And what they have done in Java 8, is compact profiles. So as of Java 8, you'll be able to get um, multiple different versions of Java SE, which have got stripped out class libraries to reduce the footprint of the bottom. So they've stopped short of doing modularity that they expect to. And that's now kind of being deferred to Java 9. So we're expecting a Java 9 in 2015 that may have modularity in it. Um, we also expect it, well, it will probably have um, work around client commercialization, um, possibly something called struts 2.0 or packed objects, which is a way of um, writing data in such a way that other languages can access your data directly without us having to do serialization to transfer it from Java out of the process so that something else can use it. So that's been our timeline over the last... 25 years or so, from 91, where Oak started, to 96, where Java was actually released, to 2013, where we're expecting Java 8 to be released around about September this year. So Oracle tries to release Java in time for Java 1. Java 1 should be, I think it's September 26th um, in San Francisco. So that is their target date to have it out by then. So, if we now actually look at what's in Java 7 today, um, what was that stuff that they actually put in there? Um, as I said, it's not actually much, but there's been a, a trend to go back and look at the programming language. Um, there's been a lot of competition from other languages these days. There's lots of scripting languages, and there's lots of new language which is designed to make it easier for the developer to write code rather than um, be statically typed and being a safe language to use. So it's now all about speed of development. So they're trying to build some of the speed of development into Java. So for Java SE7, um, basically what happens under the, um, under the Java community process is there's a whole bunch of JSRs, uh, Java specification requests. And there's an umbrella JSR which, um, for each release, which is a list of the other JSRs which are going into it. For Java 7, that was 337. And they basically in three, included three main JSRs. The first one is 334, which is called Small Enhancements to the Java Programming Language. 
Um, the second one was more new I.O. Um, APIs uh, called NIO2. And the third is dynamically typed languages. Um, so trying to get languages other than Java running on top of the JVM. And they did a number of other um, small changes around security and looking the field and, and UI work. Uh, but in terms of what happened in Project um, Coin, so when they did small language changes, um, they termed the project Project Coin because Coin is a, a bunch of small change. Um, so it's a play of words that they came up with. But the, the gist of it is um, the first main change that they made was that you can now do a switch statement on a string something that you've not been able to do in Java today. So you can switch on an int, but you couldn't switch on a string because the string is not a primitive, it's an object. So you used to have to do very painful things if you wanted to split switch on the content of the string. You basically had to do a lot of string compares. Um, it still does that under the covers, but as a programmer, you can just write switch string case, case one, case two, case three, and so on. Um, in fact, all of the changes under pro uh, Project Coin are just compiler tricks. It's not changed the base runtime run at all. It's changed how the compiler um, interprets your code and allows you to do things in code that you can do before. So the first one is switches on strings. The second one is, uh, so in Java 5 they introduced generics. So you could take out um, something like a map and you could say inside my map I have two types of data. One is a string and the other one is something, another type. I could declare this map string string. Now, it used to be really frustrating that when you declare your map as being a string in a string, you then have to say, well, new hash map string string, or string my type in this case. So you basically have to do the same thing twice. Um, and they kind of worked out that we can infer the right-hand side from the left-hand side. So now you don't have to do it, and the compiler fills it in for you effectively. Uh, the third is the way you can uh, declare um, literals. So you can now uh, define binary literals. You used to be able to do hex, not. Um, op Octet? No. Octal. 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 That's the one. Yes, yeah. you used to be able to declare octal. Um, you can now declare uh, binary. And if you want to, you can now put underscores in numbers. So if you wanted to put an underscore in a number to make it visually easier to see what the number is. So in the same way that we put a comma um, every three zeros and on the continent they put a full stop every three zeros, you can put an underscore in so that you can uh, make it easier for you to read the literal. Um, and they can add some uh, simplified value arc support as well. Um, another thing that they've done is multi-catch. So if you have a try block that um, throws multiple different exceptions, previously you had to handle each of those exceptions separately. So if you could have a null pointer exception and an I.O. exception, you had to do two catch blocks, one for each, or use the top level, um, top level exception and accept that they're both subclasses of that. And that doesn't work with errors. So if you could get both an error and an exception, you had absolutely no choice but to write two catch blocks. Um, what you can now do is do um, a multi-catch. So you declare the types that you want to catch with a vertical separator between them, and it will run the same code for all exceptions of those types. So again, it just saves you having to do uh, more work as a programmer when you're writing your code. Um, another one is automatic resource management. So you can now put um, things like the opening and closing of file streams. Right, You have to close these strings down, um, streams down manually. Now, usually the best practice approach for that is you do your try book, you do a catch, you do a finally, you close it in the finally. You no longer have to do that finally because it will do it for you. So you write a try block that creates some strings, uh, streams. If it fails to create the stream, and you would normally have to close it down, it effectively puts the finally block in for you. So again, it's a compiler trick to make it easier for the program. Um, new IO2. So what was introduced in uh, Java 6 was new IO, um, and that gave non-blocking IO. Um, what's been introduced in new IO2 is asynchronous IO. So you have a futures object or a completion handler 
And what you can do is basically farm off work packets, which will return to you once your I.O. is completed. So you can allow I.O. to happen on other threads without you having to worry about it. It's a simplification again. Uh, they've also introduced the improved file system API. So if you've ever tried to write code that integra integrates and interacts with a file system, it's been very, very painful. It doesn't let you do much because most of the operating systems deal with their file systems different ways. So they've reworked the file system API so that you can actually do things with the file system without having to reach out to native code or starting to do runtime execs. Um, so they've added a lot of flexibility in there. Uh, one of the things in particular is you can actually set a watch point on a file name and be notified when that file has changed. Uh, previously, you had no choice but to write a poll that continually goes to the file. Um, and there's been work on the concurrency and collections. Um, so if you ever do parallel work, um, fork join was added in Java 7. So the ability to, to do multi-threaded work over a data set. Um, that was added, which is very useful for anybody that is doing parallel processing or trying to break down huge sets of work. So it's being exploited by things like Hadoop. Um, transfer queues is another one. So in Java 6, you've got uh, the blocking queue added. And what the transfer queue does is if you put an object onto a blocking queue, the thread that puts it on there now, um, now blocks and waits for someone else to take it off the queue before it returns. And they've added more um, synchronization primitives via the phaser. So all minor things, all for fairly specialized um, groups. Really the main thing that came into Java 7, which people will use a lot, is the project coin language um, features. And these are all about trying to compete with other languages where it's, always, it's already easier. Um, so that brings us to, to Java 8. Um, so what's going to be happening next? So I, I will state that this point in time that the JSR337, which is the umbrella JSR that says what's going to go into Java 8, is not closed. So we do not 100% know what's going into Java 8. We can only tell you where the development line is at the moment and what's likely to be in there. So the main thing is Lambda expressions. So being able to put anonymous functions or methods um, as parameters. Um, an extension to that is something called virtual extension methods. Um, and we'll go through both of those. Um, and then on top of that, there's a whole number of uh, JSRs and, and what they call JEPs, so Java Enhancement Proposals. And those are really features which go in which are too small to get uh, a JSR in its own right. So a number of those are, are being brought in as well. But really, the main two are Lambda expressions and the virtual extension methods. And um, I'll go through the, the compact Java SE profiles as well. So Lambda expressions. So in Java at the moment, there's something called um, anonymous classes. So you can create an anonymous inner class. You can basically create a class on the fly. Now, a good example of where that happens is things like runnable, or where you're um, going to use the security provider, where you're adding an event listener. So in this case, we've got an event listener that we're about to add. And the way you would do it is you would say, well, create me a new listener object, and I'm going to override its um, event callback method. And this is what my event callback method is going to be. So I can create an anonymous inner class as, I, as I'm going. So that solves the problem for me, but it's kind of bulky, it's slow to do, um, and it's a little annoying to have to do it. And you've got some problems with, with leakage, and there's problems with scoping of variables. So when you, um, when you are writing code inside here, um, it's hard to know whether the, this pointer applies to your inner class or the enclosing class. And it does confuse a number of a number of developers. So what's introduced with Lambda expressions in Java 8 is the ability to create what's effectively anonymous methods. So you can create a method on the fly that you can then pass as a parameter to a function. Um, so if I give you an example, if you had a, a data set and you wanted to be able to query that data set, 
you've got two choices of what you could do. Right? You could write a whole series of APIs that says, go into my data set and tell me about, I don't know, um, marbles which are orange. Or tell me about marbles which are bigger than golf balls. Or tell me about marbles which are the size of all bearings. Right? You, you have to have several APIs to be able to have methods that query that data set. What would be much simpler is if you had one API that says query my data set, and I just pass in as a parameter a method that knows how to get the results that I want. So I would pass in a method that says if marble is blue and greater than the size of a golf ball, return this marble. And that's a one line method. Now, what lambdas allow you to do is to create anonymous methods and then pass them around as parameters to functions. So basically, what you have here are three lambda expressions. The first one says, create me a method that just returns integer.size. The second one says, create me a method that takes two parameters, x and y, and what it does inside that method is add the two together. So that anonymous method would return x plus y. And the third one, takes two parameters, a string and an integer, it take, um, inside the method it does this, which is to say, take your integer, add two to it, print out the string, and then return my original integer plus two. So anything that's a simple method that has a return and takes some arguments can be, can be declared on the fly, in line with your code as an anonymous method. And once you've done that, you can actually pass it around as parameters. So it makes it very easy to do things like, um, in the fault join effect framework, what you're trying to do is parallel processing. So you can actually say, here's the method that I want you to go off and parallel process with. So what it should do is simplify existing APIs. So where we said before, if I wanted to add an event listener, I would create a new listener object and override its method and tell it what I want it to do. What I can actually do is say, well, I'm going to create the listener. Um, it's going to take a parameter of event. And what it's going to do inside its method is say, if my state is active and it's interesting, then do something in return. So I can actually create that in line. As a, as a lambda method. Now, that allows you to do internal operations a lot easier, and you can do things in terms of internal recursion. So if you're iterating over a collection, you can do, um, today, four elements of um, in my collection called element.reset. Um, now I can do the same thing using a new function called, uh, sorry, new method on each collection called for each. And I can say for each of the um, elements, I want to perform this method. And again, I could pass this method in as a parameter if I wanted to. So where you're doing that, one of the new um, methods which are being added to all of the classes is something called for each. And that brings us on to, no, it doesn't quite, okay. Um, and there's also support in, in lambdas for, for stream operations. So where you're iterating over streams, it makes it much easier to do that. But um, if we come back to the for each method, okay, so one of the things that's happened in Java 8 is every collection is now going to have an additional for each method. Um, now, one of the problems with that is Whilst you've got binary compatibility, if you take code that works on Java 7 and you try and run it on Java 8, it will run. If you try to recompile your code on Java 8, you'll start getting errors because you haven't implemented the for each method if you're subclassing a collection or you're subclassing something that now has a for each method. So you have to do your own implementation of it because it's a new interface method. What they've added in Java 8 is for the ability for you to create default implementations. So when you create an interface, rather than just creating the method headers, you can now implement a default method. And this means that you can now add things into interfaces in later releases. 
without having to worry about breaking um, source compatibility when people try and move up levels of API. They don't have to now do an implementation of that method because it's required as part of the interface. They will just automatically pick up the default version. Um, and the way it chooses which default to use is um, basically in terms of inheritance, it will take the lowest level of inheritance that provides a, a version of the method. So if I'm um, extending an interface, and that interface is an implementation of a default for that method, it will pick that up for you. If there's its superclass also has a default, you will take the lower one because it's closer to your function. And I think um, really one of the last things that they've added to, uh, to Java 8 in terms of uh, language changes is annotations on Java types. So um, in Java 6, they added annotations so you could annotate uh, methods. What you can now do is annotate um, Java types as well. So you can take a string and you can annotate it to say, this should be not null so it's just extending the scope of annotations and really will get used by um, IDEs and those kind of people to improve tooling to do um, development time checking for you. Uh, they've added a new support API. Um, so there's the date and time API. Um, date and time has been catastrophically bad in Java for years. Uh, as countries around the world change their time zones. And there seems to be a tendency for, for countries to change their time zones on different days in different years. Um, when it came to the millennium, there was a small island off New Zealand that elected to change it so that they would uh, change um, their time zone so that they would be the first place in the world to be in the new millennium. So they just elected to do that. And any country can elect to change their time zone at any point in time. So every time that happens, the JDK has to be updated to know about the new map of time zones. So we've had problems maintaining and keeping the, the time zone um, format consistent. So there's some rework needed on a maintenance side. But there's also the problem that actually a lot of the date and time API was spread all over the place. So there were bits of it in Java Util, there were bits of it in Java SQL, there were bits of it in Java Text. Um, and it's just been very bad. So it's one of these things that needed refactoring for some time, and it's just been refactored. Um, so the final thing that they did, and this isn't something that they really did, um, that's what they intended to. Basically, there's been this whole drive to reduce the footprint of Java for some time. And the aim in Java 7 was to do modularity. That got pushed out to Java 8. Um, it's turned out that they're finding modularity much harder to do than expected. When you think of modularity in Eclipse, and you think of it in OSGI, um, one of the advantages, almost everything there is done as a Java bundle. And when you start to want to do modularity in the JDK, then you have to start worrying about native code. And in fact, one of the, the goals of Oracle is to make the JDK itself modular. So whilst they're having problems doing this, they also know that there is a need to take the JDK, which is now 105 meg as a zip file, 210 meg on disk, and make it smaller, uh, because we're now looking at much smaller devices, um, you know, ARM, Linux on ARM, Raspberry Pi, etc., trying to run Java. So they want to make it smaller. So their stepping stone on this path in Java 8 is something called profiles. So they're calling them compact Java SE profiles. So what they've done is they've created a profile called Compact One. Uh, this is 10 meg in size and contains only a very basic set of the Java class libraries. So you get things like Java Lang, IO, text, math, networking, um, and some security. So it should be the minimum amount to be able to run something on a server. No UI, no, no, um, no GUI. Um, if you need more than that, they created Compact 2. And Compact 2 is 17 meg and consumes Compact 1, so it's an extension. Um, there you get XML, you get SQL, you get RMI, you get some of the transaction code. 
After Compact 2, then you've gone to Compact 3, which starts to give you Java Lang management, gives you the ability to do bytecode instrumentation, more cryptography, scripting, um, remote security and authorization, and so on. And then you've got the full Java SE. Um, so what they're trying to do is say, we've got these profiles that you can now use. It's not modularity, right? You can't pick and choose which packages you actually need in order to run your application. You can't have them dynamically load at runtime which ones you need. But what we can do is basically make sure that each of these profiles are distinct and isolated. So there is no um, cross-linking between them. There is nothing in um, Compact 2 that requires a class from Compact 3. So when they were doing modularity, they were breaking the packages down, breaking the, um, the links between different classes down. And this is as far as they've managed to make it for Java 8. Um, so Java 8 should be out in, in September. Um, it's got Lambda support in there, which is going to make it easier to write certain types of code. Um, and probably will be of a big benefit to anybody that's doing large parallel computing. Um, for a number of other people, I don't think it's going to be a big change. It's just bringing parity with other languages. It's got compact SE profiles. Um, one of the, the benefits for that is the fact that you can now run on smaller devices. Um, it's got some date time changes, but again, there's nothing particularly major in there. Um, but some of the stuff that's coming down the line is, is looking better. Um, so there's modularity and reduced footprints. Um, I'm not actually going to talk too much about that because it's becoming clear that Oracle don't yet know how to implement it. Right? What they do want to do is allow you to take something that would be your application in a JAR file. And in fact, the whole of the Java SE API will be a collection of JAR file modules. You'll create a registry on your machine that has access to all of them. And when you deploy your application, you will just define which modules it needs, and it will load only those into the Java runtime. And in fact, it should be able to pull them off a, a public um, website as well. So if you've used languages like Node, it's exactly the same. When you create a Node application, um, you add a package.json file that says, these are the modules that my Node instance needs. And when you deploy it, it reaches out to a public um, cloud broker that brings down the latest versions of those modules. So that's where they want Java to get to, but it's still not clear how they're going to do that. So we'll leave that to one side. Um, another thing that's being worked on is um, the idea of struts 2.0 or packed objects. So when you create an object in Java code, um, you get a Java object on the Java heap, which has a defined layout, which is particular to Java. Um, it's not possible to have another process running C or COBOL or Fortran access your data that's on the Java heap. So this means that if you want to take something that's on the Java heap and give it to another process, you have to serialize it and then pass it over using a common protocol. So you, this is what we all for, this is what uh, we use XML transforms for, this is what um, you know, SCA or any other uh, transform format is for. You take your Java object, you put it in a common format, you make it into a binary file, you send it over a network or into a file, something picks it up the other side. What the whole idea is for data access platform integration is to say, well, why don't we just write it to a shared bit of memory in a format that's defined that the other side can read? So it should be allowed to I.O. in Java without having to do serialization and going into the intermediate file formats and sending it over a wire. Um, and then the other two things are cloud and multi-tenancy and other language on the JVM. And those are the two that I'm going to go into. Um, I'm kind of biased on the first one because it's one of the things that I work on. Um, and for the second one, I think it's just actually quite a, um, some interesting work that's going on. So, Cloud and multi-tenancy. Um, this is kind of built off a, a Gartner report that says that um, for enterprise customers, um, where everyone used to be is on the far left. Right? When you were running uh, your applications inside your data center, you have a data center floor. You have infrastructure, so let's think of those as machines. On each machine, you have an OS, some middleware, 
your application, and then you have uh, users on your application. So this is where we used to be on the far left. Um, then what happened was someone came up with the idea of sharing hardware. Right? So this is virtualization, having two operating systems, maybe two instances of the same operating system running on the same hardware. So if you use VMware or any hypervisor, what you've got is two virtual operating systems running on the same machine. So that was a step forward, and it meant that we could share servers. Now, the step after that of getting more and more densely packed applications today is sharing an operating system. So you may have a virtual operating system, but you could run four or five Java processes inside it. So that allows you to pack more software together. Um, and you can go further than that, you can share your middleware. So if you use an application server, you can run multiple applications inside your application server. Okay, that's fine. And on the far right hand side, you can actually share an application. So if you think about it, um, Facebook has thousands of users running the same application. So as you get further to the right, you get more users and more units of work off the same hardware and same software. But as you move to the right, you also introduce problems. So if I have two Java processes running in the same operating system, one of them can use all of the memory. One of them can use all of the CPU, and it steals from the other one. I mean, that's, that's one of the problems that we tried to solve by having virtual operating systems. Rather than having two processes in the same OS, and one of them can use all of my physical memory and all of my CPU, I've kept them separate by having two virtual operating systems. So what we're trying to do in Java is actually do the same thing. So the shared middleware case supposedly solves that because you have middleware with two applications running on top of it. And the middleware needs to be responsible for, for keeping those applications apart. Now, the problem there is that you do get collisions. Right? If both applications want to use the same URL, or both applications want to um, set a static variable inside a class, then you have a problem that you can't run those two applications inside the same middleware. You have to run two lots of middleware, possibly on two different machines. So you get collisions in terms of URLs, cache, CPU, memory, and I.O. So what we've been working on is something called the multi-tenant JDK. So the idea is inside your machine, right? you can do this on your laptop. If you were to run two Java applications, you currently get two running JVMs with two applications. But one can steal the CPU from the other. If one of them starts running at 100% CPU, and you only have one, one CPU box, your application gets no CPU time and effectively hangs and gets no work done. So what we're looking at is, if you want to run two applications, you can run them on the multi-tenant JDK inside the same Java process. And that Java process will keep the two separated. So if you, look at, um, if you look at what happens today in terms of virtualization, if you've ever used uh, VMware to, to run virtual operating systems, when you run VMware, it gives you uh, file system isolation. So you appear to have two file systems. Um, each of those is a disk quota. It can limit the amount of I.O. each process can do. Uh, it limits memory, it limits CPU, it limits um, network. Now, there's a layer on top of um, uh, VMware and uh, OS isolation called uh, something like OpenVZ. So this is a, a lightweight OS container that looks like an OS, but is actually the kernel faking up two copies of your OS. And that has all of the same support. So we're building the same things into the multi-tenant JDK. We can say that your Java application has a limit on the amount of I.O. it's allowed to do. It has a limit on the amount of RAM it's allowed to use. It's got a limit on the amount of CPU it can use. So what that looks like is this. So if you want to run a multi-tenant Java application, uh, the first thing that you do is you say, I want to run multi-tenant Java rather than normal Java by just adding minus XMT. So it's probably hard to see, but you do Java minus XMT minus jar, one.jar. Right? My application is called one. So that's all I do. I add minus XMT on the command line. What this will do is 
it will create a Java process called Java D, the Java daemon. If, it, if you don't have one already, it will create it. If you um, do have one, it just locates it. It finds it using a, a semaphore to find out where the process is. It then takes your application and creates it as a tenant inside the Java D daemon. So at this point, it looks pretty much the same as just running Java, right? I have a JVM and I have my application, right? Nothing's changed. Now, if I wanted to add a second tenant, I do exactly the same thing. I run Java minus Java, sorry, Java minus XMT to say one to ten in Java minus Java, and I'm going to run my application called two dot Java. So it's a completely different application, um, but we follow the same process. I locate the Java D daemon, um, and I create the second tenant inside the same JVM. So I've got one JVM running two Java applications. And I can actually put controls on each of these. So if you do minus XMX512N to say, you know, I would normally create a JVM with a 512 meg heap, it means that this tenant cannot use more than 512 megs worth of heap. If it does, it gets an out of memory error, exactly as you would before. But on top of that, you can say, well, actually, I don't want it to ever use more than two CPUs worth of uh, CPU at any point in time. If it does, if it tries to, we just stop it. We slow the threads down so it doesn't use the CPU. So this can no longer steal CPU time from this, and it can't steal memory from this. So I can have multiple Java applications running inside the same JVM, relying on the JVM to isolate them from each other whilst at the same time getting an advantage of having one copy of common code. So whilst these may be two completely different applications, things like Java um, lang object, right, file, file input, file output stream, you only need one copy of these. They only need to be just in time compiled once and stored by the Java daemon. So you've got lots of memory structures which are shared. And you've got lots of optimization done by the just-in-time compiler, which can now be shared between the two. So you get a massively reduced memory footprint, and it starts off faster. So you've got a much faster startup time and much lower footprint, which means that if you wanted to run this on a, a server environment, and you're running an environment for your developers, you can have thousands of developers running inside the same JVM at much reduced memory footprint, so you save on your hardware. Um, now, the other one is other languages on the JDK. So, what I said earlier was a lot of the language changes which have been brought into the JDK have happened somewhat because of competition from other language vendors. So, we've, we've brought in Lambda support because other languages have Lambdas. We did a lot of the small changes in Java 7 and more in Java 8 because it was things other languages already did. Right? Most other languages let you switch on a string. So we've now done it to, to kind of compete with the other languages for developers. But one of the other things is, you know, in the good old days, all Java applications, well, all enterprise applications were Java, and all you had to do was Java. Um, there's now um, an increasing trend to start writing applications in other languages or in fact to have applications which are multi-language. I mean, there's um, a, a quite a big trend these days to do um, the presentation layer using things like JavaScript, um, particularly with the move to HTML5. So one of the problems with mobile platforms is there's so many of them, right? You write your mobile application for iOS or Android or one of the others. And if you were to do it in native um, iOS or Android code, it's different. You've basically got to write your application twice. Now, HTML5 is supposed to solve this. Um, and that means you've got JavaScript that you can write on the client side, and you've got JavaScript that you can write on the server side. So you end up with the presentation layer being in JavaScript. But there's not really good implementations of server-side JavaScript for the enterprise applications at the moment. So you end up with people doing applications with multiple layers and different parts to it in different languages. So lots of different languages being used, and those have got lots of different frameworks. So if it's Java, you're using Java EE. If it's Ruby, you're probably using Rails. If you're using JavaScript, you're probably using Node, and so on. 
So lots of different languages out there all being used together. So what JDK has done is try to build in support for you running other languages on top of this, the JVM. So in Java 7, they brought in JSR 292, which is called Invoke Dynamic. Um, there's also been added uh, an API for interoperability. So certainly JavaScript and uh, things like Python, Python are doing big support for JSON. Um, so JSON support is now being built into um, the latest version of the specification. And this means that you can now start running Java, other languages on top of the JVM, and you can do interoperability with other languages. So support for things like Jython and JRuby have been around for a while. Um, and the JVM is trying to make sure that if you write another language, you can run it on the JVM if you want to, so that you can embed other languages into your Java code. Or if you just wanted to run another language on an enterprise runtime. So by being able to run something like Python on a JVM, you get monitoring and diagnostics inbuilt for free. You get a just-in-time compiler for free. Right? These are all things which things like PHP and Python don't really have in their own runtimes yet. So it kind of brings them up to speed very quickly. Um, but there is a problem for this, and that's that most of the new languages are dynamically typed, and Java is statically typed. So we're trying to make dynamically typed languages run on a strongly statically typed uh, JVM. Um, now, whilst Java is statically typed, most of that's actually at the compiler level. Once you've compiled it and you've converted it down to bytecodes, um, at the bytecode and opcode level, it can actually deal with uh, dynamically typed languages a lot better. So they do have, um, the opcodes are typed um, for the primitives. So there's a type for int and, um, and a type for long and a type for double. Uh, but when it comes to objects, those are just an object reference. So we can actually, we have objects that just deal with objects generically. So whatever their type is, we don't really care. So when you're moving variables around, that works fine. Um, where Java is strongly typed and enforces it is when you do method invocation. When you call a method, um, it uses the full method signature, and that includes the return type and the type of all of the operands that goes into it. So the problem with Java running dynamic languages isn't dealing with variables, it's dealing with calling methods. So what they did in 2.92 in Java 7 is to introduce um, what's called invoke dynamic. So that's a method caller which can then be dynamically typed later. Um, again, it's not something that any Java programmer is ever going to need to deal with unless you're trying to write a framework for running JavaScript or Ruby or Python on top of the JVM. But for those guys, what it means is that they can runtime wire um, your caller to the type that you're calling. Um, the, the simplest analogy for this is if you've um, seen films of how telecoms exchanges worked in like the 40s and 50s, where you had um, a lady that gets called and, and is asked to put you through to a given number, and she puts the wire into the box for you, then that's effectively what Invoke Dynamic does. You make a call and you build a framework around Invoke Dynamic that says, OK, what do I need now, now I need to plug this into? So it puts a level of indirection in there that allows you to now call a method to any type. Now, the effect of that is it makes dynamic languages run significantly faster. Um, and in order to prove this, um, Oracle started something called Project National, which is JavaScript running on the JVM. Now, there used to be, or there, there still is, um, a Java on the JVM project called Rhino. Uh, so Nashorn is German for Rhino. Um, so it's, it's the next evolution of this. And Rhino was in the days before Invoke Dynamic. So what they've done is they've done a new JavaScript framework that uses Invoke Dynamic. Um, on the left-hand side is a chart that I've stolen from uh, the Nashorn team's presentation at Java 1, where they show the compatibility. So uh, the top line is Nashorn, where they basically say they're 100% compatible with the JavaScript API. Uh, Rhino is at the bottom, which is at about 90%. So 
So they're basically saying we've got better functional compatibility than Rhino did. Um, on the right hand side is the difference in performance. So the red bars are Rhino, the white bars are National. So the effect of using Invoke Dynamic is that JavaScript on the JVM now runs up to four times faster. And when they produced these slides, they did say that so far they've been concentrating on functional compliance and not performance. Um, so that's the performance that they got pretty much out of the box. And now they're doing performance engineering with the aim to GA this with Java 8 in October. Um, so at that point, they should have significantly better performance for running JavaScript on the JVM. And again, if the question is, why would you want to do that? It's back to, if you want to serve applications on a mobile, then you want to be serving HTML5, and you want to be able to use Dojo and Ajax, etc., on the client side, and being able to write JavaScript on the server side and the client side allows you to do that much, much more easily. So that's our um, whistle-stop tour of what's happened with Java over the last... 25 years, um, what's coming in Java 8 and some of the stuff that's probably coming after that? So, questions? I want to go back to basics a little bit. Mm -hmm. I, I think we're all a little bit, maybe a little bit stunned. I mean, my immediate <laughs> reaction is that's a lot different from the Java last time I touched it. Um, but you had a question. Uh, and I'm not a Java programmer at all, but my the, the recurring theme that I get using Java applications is when it goes wrong, you get a little list as long as, as, long as you're on of function calls. Is that just bad programming, or is that inherent in the language? So, so the question was, when you get a problem with Java, you get a, a huge stack trace, and it, it, does that mean that Java's done a bad job and they're inefficient? Or does it mean something else? Um, I think it's a good and it's a bad thing. Right? It's, it's a bad thing because it means that it's 15 years worth of evolution that has led to layers on top of layers on top of layers. And it, it's true that the download size, as we saw in the Compact SE profiles, is, is like 120 meg for, for full SE now. Um, and that's because they've allowed frameworks to build on top of each other. Um, the other side of it is it provides a lot of transparency. Um, so you can see what is happening. And one of the things that you can actually do with Java now that I've not seen really that well with other languages is that whilst you have a stack trace there, um, you can actually now get a stack trace where you see every operand as being passed at every level of uh, the methods in the stack trace. And you can see every object that's being referenced from those stack frames. And you get the ability to do that because it's Java. Um, so in some ways, it's a good thing because you get that detail. It makes it easier to debug. It's a bad thing because, yeah, if you've got stacks which are 150 frames deep, you're doing something wrong. And uh, it's where it's it even evolved over time, unfortunately. Can you actually switch that off for a you know, you're actually releasing that? Um, or is that just inherent in, in the language? So can you switch it off? Yes, you can actually say, give me exce exceptions with no stack trace. Um, and generating stack traces is pretty expensive. Um, so yes, there is an option to turn it off. Um, and I think, in fact, they recently modified the options that you can limit the number of stack frames that you get. Um, but yeah, it's also true that your, your application should really run clean with no exceptions. <laughs> so, so then you only get the 150 frames when you need them. Can you collapse it so you don't get, say, the bottom level so you're already happy? Well, yes, yeah, so I, I think they brought in an option so you can say only give me the last 50 frames or so. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I can't resist one comment. I, I would just like to say that all languages would have this stuff. It's just ending up under the carpet and nobody looks. Um, but what I really wanted to uh, ask is, well, I mean, I've got several questions, but, um, but I think the most important one is about generics, because well, that has only been half done in Java when it was introduced, and the second half has never been done. 
a result of which is that, well, to my knowledge, uh, to this day, it's not possible to, I mean, to, 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 to have arrays of generic types. And where many other funny properties that, well, much as I can tell, all trace back to the concept of erasures, which I think is not particularly fortunate to put it mildly. I mean, are there any, uh, uh, well, is there anything on the horizon that this could be fixed? Um, I'm not aware of anything. No. Uh, it's fair to say that I think generics was raised as a JSR maybe five or six years before it appeared. So it took them a while to get to where they did. Um, but no, I'm not aware of anything that's designed to add generics to arrays. Um, there is work being done on arrays to make them more efficient, uh, to try and pack their size down. And I mean, that's, that's quite different though, because well, I mean, it, is, it, it does get very difficult to express things that from the perspective of the problem domain are entirely reasonable to express, but then it's not possible because of the limitations of well, what I consider to be a somewhat half-baked generic system. Well, so the thing is that a side effect of being able to do um, arrays of structures, which is what they want to do, is that it might actually introduce the generics to the arrays as a side effect, because you're now saying it's an array of this type. Did you have another question? Well, maybe I'll skip the Well, let some, uh, somebody else have another question. Yeah. Over the back. You, you've been involved with Java for a number of years, and you mostly worked with Sun, and then you worked with Oracle. Which one's easier to work with? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, what changes did you see? It's largely the control? same people. Um, and I think the interesting thing is that, so for about eight months before the acquisition, um, and eight months afterwards, it was very difficult to get anything out of the, the, the team from Sun. So it was like they didn't know what they were allowed to talk about anymore. Um, and you, you still see it now, that now that they're under Oracle, in the same way I showed the disclaimer on the second slide, um, they now have to do a lot of things that IBM makes you do, like go through revenue recognition training and what you are and not, are not allowed to talk about before it's been released. So you now see a lot of people very nervous about talking about things that they would be quite happy to talk about in the past. I, I used to work for some, so I know, I know it was a fun place to be. I'm not sure whether I was quite as much. <laughs> well, isn't it true that the industry has a history of companies that start young and are very freewheeling and um, they end up a little bit busy? <laughs> um, that might happen to Google one of these days. Right. Um, yeah, there's been um, some security issues uh, around the Java language, mm -hmm. which um, have forced people to update their um, their own machines, um, the language on their own machines, or even switch off. I, I've switched off Java in my uh, browser. Yeah. Uh, it's a no noticeable effect, which sort of surprises me a bit. But would it be therefore, is it true to say that most Java development is now on the enterprise side rather than on the fishing around on the client side? Um, so it's fair to say that all of those security vulnerabilities, or 98% of them, only affect the browser. So that's where it's vulnerable. When it's server side, um, we had probably a, a fairly large uh, vulnerability two years ago, uh, which we patched pretty quickly, which was a denial of service on, if you gave a particular number into parse double, it went into the loop. Um, but all of the other ones have been on the desktop. And like from an IBM perspective, we're not interested in Java on the desktop as an enterprise language for us. Right. Um, it's, it's kind of more interesting for Oracle because Oracle make money out of Java on the desktop. They sell it to enterprise customers as um, something on the desktop and they sell support for it. And it does seem that they've done a fantastically bad job of securing it. Um, now, they keep coming out with new UI languages. So uh, Java FX is recent, um, last two, three years or so. So they are investing as Java on the desktop but I think they're less interested in Java in the browser anymore. They're, they're trying to say Java should be um, like a, a desktop tool UI. 
So you run standalone Java on the desktop. And I don't think there is that much interest in Java in the browser anymore. Right. If you think about things that you can do in applets, HTML5 is supposed to let you do most of this stuff. Ajax and Dojo lets you do this stuff. So personally, I don't think Java in the browser has got too much of a future. But I, I don't work for Oracle, and I don't own that area. I, I was astonished that switching these off made no difference to my world. Yeah, I thought so. Okay. Um, C++ has just been through quite a sort of major change the latest standards. And it seems to have overtaken Java in some areas like type inference. Mm. How do you see the comparison now between the, the new C++ and, and Java? Um, so, I, I, I've never been one for, for, for you, you get people who strongly advocate a language. And my opinion has always been use whichever one makes it easiest for you to do the job. Um, now, as I've been saying, kind of the problem with Java is it's been kind of stale and it's taken a long time to, to catch up with other languages. Um, and it, it's good that they're now paying attention to that. So as the other languages are coming forward, um, that, that Brian Gertz and the team, um, he's the, the language architect, is responding to it and trying to um, put new stuff in. But I, I don't use C++ enough to, to know the difference, unfortunately. I, the, the work that I've been doing recently is actually much more on Python, Node, and uh, PHP. More questions? Yeah? OK. Um. I've no idea, but it's it's incredibly annoying. <laughs> <laughs> the the number of people who hear JavaScript and assume it's Java, um, mm. in, in the same way that in my first three or four years at IBM, I worked on JVMs, which meant I wrote all of my code in C and Assembler, and loads of people would ask me, "How do I do this in Java?" And I'm like, I don't know, I don't write Java code, I work with <laughs> Java virtual machines. It used to be called LiveScript. It was developed independently from Java by Netscape to put interactivity and animation into their web browser, Netscape Navigator. Yeah. Uh, and they didn't know anything about Java at the time. Some didn't know anything about LiveScript. It looks all the same. And then they, no. uh, well, it does <laughs> it in, in many ways. It, it, it looks the same in that it has curly brackets, but that's <laughs> the <laughs> um, but they, they actually had a meeting together and discovered that Java applets in JavaScript were doing almost the same job. Um, and um, Sun agreed to let uh, Netscape um, rename it because it was felt to be a little bit similar in the bit rather than the browser and gave them a permission. Uh, but they're the, they're, the term, they're the similarity finishes. That, that might have been a mistake. <laughs> was there. Well, yeah, I mean, a piece of, of original confusion. Nobody needed Java applets anymore after, after Java school. So some of them were the ones that lost that. It, yeah, go ahead, John. A bit of trivial one. I always thought that uh, the German for Rhino was Gilt. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I, uh, as I said, Nashorn is German for Rhino, and now maybe they've got more than one word. I don't know. Rhino is a slang word. Yeah, Gareth is not in German. There are a lot of, I think, very familiar themes that people time solving languages 25 and 30 years ago would be at, which look as if they are still being worked on, and we may get solutions one day. Um, but I think this is one question I'd like to ask, if I may, Chris, mm -hmm. which is we've had a number of presentations on functional languages, and we know that some of the major players in the um, industry have introduced pure functional languages, or, or nearly pure, mm -hmm. somewhat pure functional languages for particular markets. How far do you think this takes the, the um, Lambda stuff, takes Java into functional territory? Well, um, the advantage is that we don't need to because it's Scala. And Scala right. is functional programming on top of Java and the JVM. All right. So it, it's one of those things where, again, I don't think Java needs to do everything. 
Um, it just needs to work with the language that you're running with if you've got particular problems that you're solving. So it just needs to be right. consistent. And Scala is probably the biggest, um, the biggest language on top of the JVM at the moment, other than Java. And there used to be people who objected that the JVM would never support certain types of languages. Do um, you think the changes are happening that will let that take place? Um, I, I think as long as Oracle wants to keep Java front and center, um, they'll continue to, to do support for other languages of any type. Um, you yeah. know, doing statically type languages would have, is easier than doing dynamically, and now that they're supporting right. those, it's, it's clear that there's a, a state being put in the ground that they yeah. don't carry it forward. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Well, any more questions? I, I think we owe Chris a very big thank you. Thanks, Greg. <laughs>